So I just brought a little piece of foam, uh, florist foam here. I'm not sure I can get rid of that ladybug or... Outside of that, okay. So this is to represent a soil particle to you. And we can look at this block of foam and we can measure the sides. It's actually a three-dimensional object. And we could measure the surface area of it. So one of the things I think that's most challenging for students is to realize that there's a lot more surface area in clay than there is in sand because they say, well, those golf balls, look at all those surfaces. Mm -hmm. They're huge. Yeah. That's got to have a lot of surface area mm -hmm. compared to all those little tiny beads. Well, when you take something like this and make it smaller, cut it in two, we've just added another surface that we have to count. And likewise, if we make it even smaller. We've created another surface to measure. So we are increasing surface area the smaller and smaller that we make these particles. So in the same volume, in other words, if we had a jar filled exactly the same, we would, let's see if I can, these guys will show up under there. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Um, you know, we've got surface area in that, but if we were to cut those golf balls in half, we were adding surfaces. Likewise, a quarter, et cetera, et cetera. So the smaller we get, the more surface area develops. Those surfaces is where water clings and minerals cling. So the more surface area you have, the more active typically the soil is chemically, but also you've got more potential for water holding capacity. So when we say the clay soils are wet, slowly draining, etc., it's because of those surfaces, they're holding on to that water. Sandy soils, the golf balls, you could imagine, are much more well drained because of those big pore spaces. Yes, they're larger <coughs> particles, but when you add up all the surfaces in that area, they're not that big. And so we've got the sort of medium-sized particles. Those are the, the little red beads you may not have been able to see from the back. And then we have these little tiny seed beads. Let me get it on here one of these days. <laughs> Hopefully you get an idea what those are like in comparison. Now, one of the other things that's kind of fun is that I, I doubt anybody here brought 100% sand for their soil. Pretty close. Okay. <laughs> anybody think they have 100% clay? <laughs> that's possible. Okay. But typically your soil is going to be a mixture of the three particle categories. And so oftentimes what I'll do is I'll say, okay, if we have sand with very large pore spaces, you know, that's one thing, the beach or playground or whatever. But we can actually add these silt-sized particles and begin to fill up this, the spaces here in the soil, okay? And now we have created a soil that has both macro pores and sort of medium-sized pores in it. So we've got some macro and some micro pores going on there. And that's probably what's happening in your soils, is that it's a mixture of all three. And we can even add in these seed beads and fill in all the little spots in between, and then you know sit down eventually in there and fill up all the little spaces in between these red beads. And so we even have much smaller micro pores. Okay? So typically we have a little bit of sand, silt, and clay in our samples, though I will say sometimes I've seen just sand and clay, very little silt. So if you don't have all three layers, don't despair. It's just, you know, silt is more something that's 
wind driven or carried by water or something like that. So you may not have natural silt sized particles in your area. The idea though is to figure out what you have and then what influence it's going to have on your practices and then what can you do about it. All right, so we talk about these as soil separates because what you did in your jar analysis is you separated your soil particles, right? So you put your soil in the jar with water and maybe some calgon. I'm not sure if you guys got a chance to use that or not. Um, sometimes you can use either dishwashing liquid or what we call calgon, the water softener, to that. And that's a deflocculating agent. You don't want to use like Dawn. You want to use more like Cascade that doesn't soap up or foam. Um, but you can put it in there and that would just help break things apart more. But water is perfectly fine. Shake it up for a few minutes, five minutes, hopefully, whatever, um, and then let it settle. And these separates then will begin to settle out. <laughs> and some scientists actually categorized all the um, divisions of sand, the silt-sized particles and the clay-sized particles, and they determined that within, I think, 40 seconds, all of the sand-sized particles fall down. So there's a mathematical equation that you can do that. Within 30 minutes, all of the silt size particles come down. And then anywhere from 24 hours to two weeks or more, a year, the clay size particles will settle down. Now, most of the time, your organic matter will remain floating. And also, your clay sometimes remains floating in the water because of the negative charges that they have. It's just a kind of electrochemical uh, reaction that they do. But just to give you an idea of what these look like, again, when we talk about sand, soil scientists go anywhere from very fine sand to very coarse sand. It can be anywhere, in other words, that rock or gravel is anything over two millimeters in diameter. But if it's anywhere between 0 0.05 and two millimeters, that is considered sand. So if you were to compare it to objects, the very coarse sand would be 36 inches in diameter, but it could also be as small as one and three quarter inches and still be considered a type of sand sized particle. So, but they're still big. They're much bigger than these guys, the uh, silt, 0.05 to 0.002 millimeters. And then anything less than 0.002 millimeters is considered to be clay. Now, you can easily see these very coarse sand grains, and you may even be able to see that first layer that dropped and is probably still settled there, how you know, gritty looking it is and particulate. But when you get to the silt side <coughs> particles, the grains are actually becoming invisible to the eye and they're very silky to the touch. And it, it could almost be like flour. We know that there's individual flour particles in there, um, but you really can't see them very much, okay? And so it feels silky like that as well. Clay is very sticky when wet. Again, these very small particles. Because they have those surface areas that hold on to water when we wet them, typically they're going to be sticky Boy, when they're dry, they're hard as a rock mm -hmm. almost, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm not sure what harsh meant, but hmm. anyway. <laughs> um, oh, I think in the book, um, clay soil is described as harsh soil. Okay, because of its um, chemical? I don't know. That's, that's how it says there. Yeah. Even though it's called fine texture, yes. it's called a harsh soil. I just picked that up last night. Oh, interesting. Okay. It's like from the book. Is that the same definition of harsh that we all have? <laughs> <laughs> that is a weird, weird word to use for that. Yeah. So again, sand is the largest. Okay, I always think big, basketball, golf ball, whatever. Um, and again, the size range that they have. And the spaces between them are very large, just like our golf balls had big spaces. Or if you had a bushel basket full of tennis balls or basketballs or soccer balls or whatever. Big particles, big spaces in between. And that's going to allow for lots of oxygen and aeration and very little water holding compared to the others. The silt are the medium-sized ones, so to speak. Again, the strict measurement definition of those. 
And they're a transition between the macro and the micro pores. Okay, so they're the medium, so to speak. And then when we talk about clay, and I've kind of changed my little <coughs> thing here to water droplets because they're the smallest. Oftentimes they're actually crystal formations, interestingly <coughs> enough. You can see that sometimes with the right types of uh, magnification. The pores between them are very small. They hold moisture, and these are referred to as micropores. And sometimes within that crystalline structure, sometimes water gets in there as well, and it can cause the crystals to swell. Not that you'd see this at all, it's still invisible to our eyes and to a lot of microscopes. But if you think of, um, and you may have seen, like when clay gets dry, you have those big cracks and crevices. That's when it's shrinking. So when it's dry, it shrinks. And then when it gets wet, it swells back up. Guess what that does to your foundation? Ooh. You know, the engineers want that foundation to be right next to your house and kind of holding it there, the soil. And so clay is actually really good, but when clay dries, it shrinks away. And so every once in a while, you may hear a call go out. It's like, water your foundation, you know, keep it so it doesn't shrink away and, you know, cause issues with cracks and settling and that sort of thing. Um, because if we have a real long period of drought, that can happen where it will go away if you happen to have clay, clay based soils there. Okay, so why does particle size matter? Again, you probably don't need to memorize the size, you know, definitions or anything like that, but, you know, small, medium, and large. Surface area, again, as we demonstrated, it holds water, it holds nutrients, and it also determines how aerated something is going to be. So the smaller the particle, the more surface area you have per volume. In other words, if we had a cup of those tiny beads, a cup of the medium-sized beads, and a cup of golf balls, the surface area is going to be much higher in those cup of the tiny seed beads if you added up all those surfaces. Okay? So it's going to cling to more water, and it's going to have very tiny air spaces, so not a lot of drainage. Now, again, your texture classification is what you get from that soil texture triangle is consisting of usually all three of these separate sizes, in other words, sand, silt, and clay, and it's the actual percentages. So when we use that term, soil texture, we're actually figuring out what's the relative amount of sand to silt to clay in your particular soil. And that's our jar, our jar analysis there is going to help us determine that. So even within that triangle, we can refer to our soils as being predominantly coarse, predominantly fine textured, or something in between. So if you have a very sticky clay soil, if it turns out you've got a high percentage of clay, you probably have what's called a fine soil. If you have a lot of sand in it, it's considered a coarse soil. And something in between is usually the happy medium. Because all of these things, infiltration, in other words, how does water get into your soil? It's very tiny little holes. It's very difficult for water to get in that. And it tends to just go over the surface and maybe even take the soil with it. Whereas if it landed on sand or some gravel or whatever, you could imagine the water percolating in at that point and infiltrating and then moving through the soil. So infiltration is the initial, percolation is what happens afterwards, and then how much does it hold on to that water, maybe how strong it is. And we, if you have dry soil here with you in a bag and any clods of it, we're going to do a thing called dry clod breaking. And if it's really hard to break it apart, it usually has a high amount of clay. If it's real easy to crumble apart, it may have more of the sand. And then again, your specific surface area and amounts of surfaces that you have. So in your jar analysis, again, your sand layers, you know, and, and just as a ballpark figure, I, I gave you the 40 seconds, 30 minutes, Da, 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 you know, 24 hours. Some other people just sort of break it down into something a little easier to remember. You know, all your sand's going to drop in the first minute. 
If you come back a couple hours later, you'll see probably the silt, and then your clay, and then, you know, go take a walk, uh, come back next week, maybe your clay will have dropped down. And so if you're watching this, you can actually, if it's not too cloudy as it's coming down, now, and the cloudiness would be due to that. You can start marking on your jar where the actual layers are. And always those vis visible particles that drop fast. And again, this is kind of showing some of the different sizes of sand particles. You know, it's not just one size. It can be up to four different sizes. That could be your sand layer. And then your silt layer drops later. And then the clay layer takes the longest to come down. When we measure these percentages compared to each other, if we were just to look at this, what would we think about this particular soil sample? Predominantly sand. sand. So we would think this is probably a pretty decent soil that looks like it's over 50% sand. So we're going to have probably good aeration. We're going to have um, good water movement and percolation through it. So these are all pretty decent characteristics about a soil. When it's the opposite, if that was the clay that was 50%, then we'd have a whole different situation. We would think, whoa, you know, it's going to be poorly drained. We're going to have to really be careful when we water it. Um, it's not very well aerated. We're going to have to maybe even do something about it if that's the situation. So there's a lot of things that we need to make some compensation for when we actually figure that out. Now, what we do with this is um, what we refer to as the soil texture triangle. We'll take these percentages and we'll plot them on this triangle. If our soil type ends up in these upper areas, these would be considered fine. And then if they end up more down in this area, we would consider these coarse soils. And then if they're somewhere kind of in this middle zone, these are more of the ideal soils with loam being considered, you know, the holy grail. That is like, you've got loam in here. You're cool. <laughs> you know, that's going to be your ideal soil. You probably don't have to do much to it. And you can grow anything. Most plants are happy there. Etc. You, you know, your crops, your veggies, whatever, are going to do really great. It's the people that have a lot of clay or a lot of sand that have to really think about how they're going to manage that soil. Now, we're going to actually do by hand and do a little math, but USDA does have a soil texture calculator online, so you can plug in your percentages of sand, so, or just two of them anyway, and it'll spit out the third and tell you exactly you know, where it lands on this triangle. It'll actually give you a little pinpoint for that. But we're going to do it actually um, using the triangle so you get a chance to understand how that actually works. So again, our first um, sample here is predominantly sand. This one is what we would consider loam, where we have a good distribution of the three types. And then this is more of a clay type soil. Okay? So yours will land probably in one of those three major categories. Now, we want to know this because if you've ever looked at a bag of maybe um, gypsum or a bag of sulfur to add to your soil, maybe you've looked at even some different um, supplements, perhaps you've looked at irrigation schedules. It's going to give you a different amount of minutes, a different amount of pounds per thousand square feet based on whether you have coarse, medium, or fine. Because again, the surface areas are going to react differently with calcium, with lime, with sulfur, with whatever you're doing to change your pH. It's going to react differently with certain types of maybe even pre-emergent herbicides depending on your soil texture or whatever else you're adding to the soil. So your watering schedule, again, is going to vary depending on that. So we can come up with a pretty decent, if our soil layers cooperate, um, by plugging it in here to the soil texture triangle. We can come up with that 
texture. But we can also do what's called a ribbon test. And this is something that you can do that is a little um, more of a ballpark. <coughs> something that you can feel once you get used to it. And we'll do this a little bit later. Um, Julia, are you here? So are we going to do this after lunch? Yeah. Get messy? Okay. So we'll make mud pies later. <laughs> and I'll go through um, how you do that in the procedures. But let's say you're out visiting a client or somewhere, and you don't have time to do this jar test. You don't have two weeks or 24 hours or whatever to do it. They need to know now. You can actually do a ribbon test and just make a little mud pie, so to speak, a little ball of soil in your hand, wet it, and try to extrude it and feel it and see if you can form it into anything. And it will give you a good ballpark figure of the type of soil that you have. Now again, we have a little bit of a YouTube thing. I think you've seen this um, perhaps if you had a chance to look at your resources. But um, we'll show that later. We, we're not going to do that now. We'll do it while we're actually doing it to give you an idea. Um, but when you actually get that wet soil in your hand, you're going to say, is the soil predominantly rough and gritty? And if the answer is yes, um, and it does not stain your fingers, you probably have what's referred to as sand. And again, when we say sand, we're going back to our soil texture triangle, and we're talking about this little section here. So if you have somewhere between, it looks like 80 to 100%, or 85 to 100 percent sand in it, chances are you're going to end up in that particular area, especially if you have less than 10 percent clay. That's where you're going to end up in the soil texture triangle, and you know that's how this little hierarchy works. So if, as you're feeling it, it does not feel rough and gritty, and it forms a ball and feels smooth and silky, maybe even buttery you'll end up with what's referred to as silt loam. If that still does not describe your soil, in other words, if you can make a really strong ball out of it, you can start to make vases, <laughs> snakes, and that sort of stuff. Now we're getting down into the really, truly clay. And I'm not sure what does not take a polish means, but anyway. Um, but if you have it, um, and it's also rough and gritty. You can have what's called sandy clay loam. But if it's moldable and smooth and silky, it could be silty clay loam. But if it does mold like plasticine and it's very sticky when wet, and you're really getting stained and it's just kind of a mess, then you probably have clay. If it is rough and gritty, sandy clay, and it's smooth and silky, then it's silty clay. Now, the, the operative word in all of these is usually the last word in it. So we have, these are really types of sand, sand and loamy sand. These are types of loam, okay? So these are all halfway decent, okay? And then these are all types of clay. This is your very fine soils that are going to cause you some consternation, <laughs> probably. Okay, so when we figure out our texture class, then we can make some inferences about watering habits, irrigation schedules, and then again, the amount or type of soil amendments that we might need to add to it. So if you're doing an irrigation schedule, which one do you think is going to have the shortest run time allowed? With clay. Clay, yeah. So, when you're doing your schedule, I know a lot of people say, oh, 10 minutes, or there used to be this ad, you know, don't water for more than 10 minutes. It's like 10 minutes is way too much for most types of soil. Um, but, you know, a lot of old irrigation clocks, that's the default thing, especially if you lose power sometime. My neighbors, I'll tell you, crazy. I can go out almost <laughs> any night of the week at a certain time, you know, sometimes it's midnight, sometimes whatever, and their irrigation's going off. 10 minutes is own, whether it needs it or not, and it's, the, you know, I shudder to think what their water bills are like, but they're not paying attention to it. They'll even be watering, you know, this time of year. Maybe they finally caught on. I haven't noticed it lately, but, um, but a few weeks ago, they were still watering. 
10 minutes, no matter what. But, you know, you can't adjust your clocks. So, anyway, this is a, there's a website called Be Water Wise. And it has what's referred to as an irrigation calculator on it that's kind of fun to play with. And I just ran through, um, I used the same zip code and the same type of crop, a cool season grass, same type of sprinkler. I didn't change that. The only thing is I changed from sand to loam to a clay type soil. And what it told me is that the maximum minutes per start time on a sandy soil is eight minutes. In other words, you should not run any more than eight minutes on that type of soil. If you have loamy soil, no more than six minutes. Clay soil, no more than four minutes. So for a standard sprinkler, and again, it depends on the precipitation rate of your sprinkler, but this is just the default type sprinkler that they have there. Um, it's probably putting out, I want to say, two gallons a minute or something like that, which is high, very high. It's not the more modern type of sprinkler. Four minutes is the maximum that should be running. So again, it depends on the thing. If you're using MP rotators, it goes a lot longer. But if you have those standard old spray heads that are just kind of what we refer to now as kind of old-fashioned or not the, the ones that are rebatable, so to speak, they're not the ones you should be using or continuing to use. But if you do have them, make sure if you've got clay soil that you don't run it for any more than four minutes at a time. Now, what that means is certain months of the year, you're going to have to have more start times. So when we have a week where we, maybe in the summer, June and July, we need 10 or 11 start times a week, that is a total of 40 minutes. Not that we want to do it four days a week, but in an individual day, we can run it for four minutes, stop, Maybe a few minutes, you know, half an hour to an hour later, we can do four minutes again after that first four minutes has soaked in. Do it again and again so that we're not putting all 40 minutes down, you know, 10 at a time or even, you know, 20 minutes at a time. That would be ridiculous for this type of sprinkler that's on here. So, again, you do what we call a cycle and soak, and hopefully your irrigation clock is able to be set up for that type of a system. So smart controllers are important, using the right kind of equipment when you're watering, but understanding your soil texture, ballpark it. Do I have sand? Do I have the medium? Loam? Do I have clay? If we can at least figure that out, you'll be much more water wise and much more you know, efficient in your watering and save a ton of water and avoid runoff, wasting, etc. So again, it depends on what you're growing, in this case cool season, depends on your zip code, depends on your soil, depends on the type of sprinkler, so I'm kind of simplifying it here. But if I only change the soil, it really dramatically changes the amount of run time that you can have at any one particular time. Okay? So that's one big implication of our soil texture. Now this is a little bit difficult to understand sometimes, but what this um, illustrates to you is the amount of water holding capacity that the different types of soils have. So, I guess I better talk about those um, soil moisture constants here a little bit. So if you can imagine a sandy soil reaches saturation and then at what we call field capacity, that's after all the water's drained away after a rainstorm, maybe about 48 hours later, it reaches what's called field capacity. And at that point in time, it is able to hold between the wilting point and field capacity. This is your ideal soil water situation here. And so it has this amount of soil in this so-called sweet spot. Your loam soil is holding a lot more at that point. And believe it or not, as you get more into the clay, it has less available water than it does in this ideal situation. It's got a lot more water in it overall when you add all these columns up, but this is considered saturated and that's gonna just drain away by gravity. 
this is what's held on to those soil surfaces, soil particles. So it's holding on to a lot of water, but it's not all available. And you get less and less in this particular spot as you go to larger and larger particle sizes. Um, one of the best ways I have to illustrate that concept is with a sponge. And if you have a sponge, it could be my, my vanna here. Is this dry? Yes. <laughs> we have a dry sponge. Okay. Have you two it's ever been... met before? <laughs> yeah, what's that? Have you two ever met before? No, we haven't. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, not met before, yeah. So this is um, just a good old dry sponge. It's been sitting on a shelf probably for three, four months or so. Not wet at all. And I've got a little bucket of water here, and I'm going to just soak it in here. And I'm going to do what's called saturation. So I'm going to, at, at saturation point, all of the pore spaces are filled with water. Okay, so this can happen after really um, heavy rainfall in your soil. If you think of your soil as a sponge, it's totally filled <laughs> with water. What's the first thing that's going to happen, do you think, when I pick this up? Right. Yeah, we're going to lose some gravitational water. Okay? So the force of gravity is going to take the loosely held water and it's going to drain off. And when this quits dripping, which hopefully will happen fairly soon, um, we'll reach what we call field capacity. And at that point, I think that's when we have that ideal pie chart where you've got you know, half the space is filled with air, half the space is filled with water, and it's no longer considered saturated. So this is really nice for plants. They can use this water very easily without exerting a lot of effort. Because in those pore spaces, which we've got a mixture of sizes here, water's held fairly loosely. So if I'm the plant roots extracting water, I don't have to exert much energy as a little root hair to get that water. Okay? So I'll go along and I'll use water and use water until I can't use it no more, or it's getting harder and harder and harder to get that water out of there. Okay, so I've got to really exert some effort. Well, if I have to exert that much effort as a plant root, I am definitely at the wilting point. I just, I can't, can't even, you know, I can't do that. So it's just too much of a force that the water's held to that solid object, those soil particles, that my plant root does not have the ability or the energy to get that water away. So now I ask you, is this dry? <laughs> no, it is moist, correct? <laughs> so the water that's left in here is what we refer to as unavailable water. Okay? It is at the wilting point. If I was trying to grow a plant on here, it would wilt. Not enough water available to it. So this is the unavailable water, and this is the water that you're seeing here in the more clay, the medium, and then the coarsely textured soils. Would a plant uh, respond the same way to unavailable water and <coughs> just dry soil? Yes. It's when it gets to the wilting <coughs> point, even though there's still technically water in the soil, this is still technically moist. It's just not available for that plant to get it. And so it will begin to wilt. Now, when we have an irrigation system that's automatic, mm -hmm. we would probably like to water it or turn that back on before it gets to the wilting point. We don't really want our plants to wilt. You know what happens when plants wilt? <laughs> yeah, they could die. That's the worst case scenario. What else? Yeah, they're more susceptible to insects and diseases. Somehow they just seem to know, <laughs> it seems like, that they can, you know, go to that. And then if you're trying to produce a crop, it's cutting down your photosynthesis. It's not able to produce. Your fruit's going to be smaller. Maybe your tomatoes won't be as juicy, etc. So you want to avoid the wilting point. But you really don't want to go over field capacity either, because if you go over that, what happens? Saturation, or you're wasting water. It's more water than it needs. So again, to be water wise, we try to keep it in this sweet spot here. And so 
when we have to do that in any particular soil depends on the soil texture. Which one do you think we're going to have to turn on more often? Sand. Yeah, the sand. Because it's probably going to reach that wilting point a lot quicker. And so we may have to actually water it a little more frequently just to keep those plants from wilting. Whereas if we have some clay in the soil and we begin to get into this ideal relationship with sand, silt, and clay, or even up here, you know, we don't have to water as often, okay? So because it has water holding capacity. But again, if you get too much clay in it, most of it's going to be unavailable. Again, holding tightly to those soil particles, it's a very strong attraction. It's stronger than the root being able to take it away. So yes, it's wet, but it's unavailable. Okay. So, so again, that's why we like that happy medium. Yeah. Um, I have a question. So is the ratio of water to oxygen um, the same percentage in each of our, in each of these? Probably not technically because of the larger pore spaces. Is um, in the sandy soil, you're going to have a lot more aeration because of the larger particles. Um, and in the loamy soils, you just have smaller, and as you get to the more clay soils. But I mean in each column, so depending on which soil you have. Yeah. Um, I think technically you would find a little difference between them. And I, I, I remember coming across a graphic to that extent, okay. but yeah. So you might have that 50-50 ratio, perhaps, but they're not going to be large sizes. They're going to be much smaller pore sizes. So not that there might not be some oxygen in there, but it's not going to be as frequently and or as continuous. So, you know, again, you either do something about your soil to amend it, or you change your watering practices. You settle on which plants are going to be happiest, under which one, but to try to grow you know, something that needs a lot of water, like bamboo in a sandy soil, you're mm -hmm. going to be wasting a lot of water, mm -hmm. or your water bill is going to be really high. And that's maybe not the most efficient thing you could be doing. Cactus succulents, um, native plants, plants that are more adapted to go with those highly aerated soils, longer periods without water, those are going to be your best plant palette to use in that situation. Or do something about the soil. Okay, so if you don't want to have that type of a plant palette and you'd rather increase your water holding capacity, what can you do? Add organic matter. Great. What if you've got high water holding soil and you don't want to just grow cattails? Okay. Um, what can you do to increase the aeration? Add organic matter. Oh. Unbelievably, it's the same thing. Oh, okay? That's cool. It's not really practical to add sand in this situation. It's very expensive. I suppose you could, could do it, but I've always been told and heard and kind of think it's true. When you add sand to clay, what do you get? <laughs> Cement or bricks. <laughs> That's how they make adobe. You know? The adobe walls and bricks and stuff. So it's not really a practical thing to do, but organic matter is going to get you what you want a lot quicker and a lot more easily. Now, another thing that's kind of interesting about your soil texture is how water moves through the soil. So if you have a drip irrigation system, especially those inline drip emitters where you've got every 12 inches, every 8 inches, every 18 inches, whatever. Depending on your soil texture, your spacing should be different. So if you have a sandier soil, your water column is going to go more vertically. In other words, gravity in those larger pore spaces is going to be more of an influence. Whereas when you get into these soils that have a little bit more clay in them, the clay sized particles are going to take over and those pore spaces are going to move water laterally. So you can actually space your emitters a little further apart in these types of soils and a little closer together in the sandy soil. 
So if you're working on irrigation systems like this, it's not one size fits all. Most of these emitter types of systems have different amounts of gallons per hour that they put out, and they also have different spacing available. So there's charts and things available, and I'm sure you guys are going to have an irrigation class. Um, but you do want to correlate that with your soil type, your basic soil texture. Again, very coarse, medium, and very fine textured soil, as we call it. So that's going to influence that particular part. And again, we've kind of already talked about this. What do you do to improve the texture? We got sand, more clay, something else. Yeah, it, organic matter. So one of these days, I'm going to make a t-shirt that says, when in doubt, add organic matter. <laughs> Um, how do you determine the wilting point? How can you tell when you're at the, the size of the plant's wilting? Because every plant uh -huh. wilts at a different yeah. point. Um, how do you determine when you're in the sweet spot, so ah, to speak? Okay. Like, how do you know? Your plants will be more productive, usually. Um, you can actually, there's soil moisture meters that you can use. Mm -hmm. And there actually are some soils, um, or irrigation controllers, that are actually controlled by moisture in the soil. Mm -hmm. So we have smart controllers or WIBIX that are weather-based controllers that go on solar radiation and wind and temperature and that sort of thing to tell your, um, you know, the ET or evapotranspiration, you'll probably get into all that if you haven't already, but all of that can be done and controlled by the weather or you can control it by the soil and these little um, sensors in the soil, you set it, you tell it what soil texture it has and it can read it because, um, Water conducts electricity, I guess, is the basic theory, and then it can adjust accordingly. So um, you can put one here, one here, and then when this one gets to a certain point, and that one gets to a certain point. Time to turn the, you know, the irrigation on. And so it knows, or it can sense when to do that. So soil sensing is another way to control that. Now, the other thing I also say that you can do if you have lousy texture, is to look at your structure. <clears throat> so what we did in this jar analysis is we destroyed the structure of the soil. This is your structure, what you have in your plastic bag. You can see clumps and clods and you know things that are visible. Okay, that is not individual grains of sand or individual right. grains like you're seeing in your jar here that we pulverized and shook the bejeebers out of. <laughs> okay. So structure takes over if you should have poor texture. Does anybody have real chunky soil? Big clods or clumps? And again, sometimes it's more visible when it's drier. Yeah, these are kind of tending a little towards chunky. But not too bad. Um, very good structure in there. Okay. And so that structure, again, provides big clods and little clods that are going to add more aeration to your soil. And also contribute to some of these, you know, aeration, drainage, percolation issues that we might have. <clears throat> so again, we've talked about the concept of macro pores and micro pores. Mostly it's the macro pores that are going to have the air and water, and it's the micro pores that are going to have mostly water. So that kind of gets back to his question. Yeah, your question about that. So the more micro pores you have, the more likely they're filled with water. But it does depend a little bit. So you can see these little teeny tiny little um, spaces up there. Here's my handy dandy pointer here. These are little tiny micropores, and this is a macropore. Okay. So we've got macropores here because of the structure, and that's going to allow some drainage through there and some aeration. Whereas in the soil clod itself, those individual particles are forming what we call micropores. So water flow then, on this sort of small scale, is going to be happening either with the macropores going sideways or downward, 
you know, or this convoluted path. And then we've got the micropore flows in between these other areas where it actually seems to be more saturated here where we have a lot of smaller particles, we have more water than we have air. Whereas between the bigger particles, we've got some airflow and some water flow that's able to do that. So don't despair if your texture is bad, your structure might actually be pretty decent. <coughs> so structure is formed when the soil clumps together to form aggregates. And these naturally occurring aggregates are referred to as PEDs. And if they happen to be caused by rototilling or some sort of tilling, we refer to them as clods. So you may have seen you know, a field that's been plowed, these big clumps that form, those are going to be called clods. Whereas if it's something that you have on a small scale in your bag, those are usually referred to as the PEDs. So there's various types, as you can imagine, like there's all different types of things. And this is another physical um, thing that we can look at and view. And there's types, classes, and grades. We don't need to worry about that so much. But again, when you dig up soil and you kind of expose it and throw it out there, it usually is in these clumps or clods here. And what they can be are what we refer to as granular. They can be platy. They can be angular blocky, subangular, prismatic, or columnar. Now this means a lot to a soil scientist. <laughs> um, and as you can see, these occur in different parts of the soil horizon. So typically in that topsoil layer is where we have the granular. But if we have um, this E zone, which some people may or may not have, you may actually have platy types of structures that have formed. But oftentimes, if you don't have that E zone, you may go just A over B. In the B zone, down in that subsoil, the part that they leave behind after they scrape away the topsoil, this could be the type of structure that was left after the bulldozers went away. Now, the other thing they did is they probably compacted it quite a bit, which is, adds to the issue or the problem squeezes out the air, this destroys the structure. Um, but by far, probably the one you want to shoot for is the granular structure. Okay. Now, we can also have what's called structureless soil. You can destroy your structure, or naturally, maybe there is no structure. So sand on the beach, no structure. That's just grains of sand. Nothing is clumping or holding together because it's just continually tossed and individual grains are ebbing and flowing as you know the tide goes in or waves crash on it, et cetera. And so that's considered a single grain soil or in your sandbox, okay? Um, fine textured soils that lack structure or function can be called massive soils. And that's sort of the opposite, but it's also a sort of structureless soil. In other words, if you have soil that you have continually, you know, uh, run vehicles over, it's just massive. There's no airspace, there's no clumps or clods or anything. It's just one big, like a rock, a big monolith kind of thing that's, the structure has been destroyed. You can over-till your soil, rototilling too much. I hate to break it to you, those that own rototillers or like to get out there and do that. You're really destroying structure sometimes when you do that. So it is something to be aware of. But the good news is you can build structure and you can encourage structure. Because structure is formed by plant roots, microbes, all those little things that they give off, organic matter, all of that helps to build structure. And one of the things we also found that microbes are really important in building soil structure. If you can keep those microbes happy, you will end up with decent structure. Microbes are living organisms. They can be fungi, bacteria, whatever. They like a certain type of pH. They like a certain amount of oxygen, typically. And if you go back to that little video of the, the belching, uh, I forget his name, but <laughs> anyway, the guy that was burping all the time, he didn't like oxygen, methane. Yeah, he wanted you know that anaerobic bacteria kind of situation. Well, he's not much for structure, okay? But 
other orga organisms are. And so if we've got the things that make plants happy, typically that's also what's going to make microbes happy. So later on this afternoon, we're going to test our pH. We'll talk a little bit about chemistry and how that works. And then, um, again, proper watering, not too wet, not too dry. And then, of course, the proper nutrients. They like all that. A word about compaction. Uh, we face this a lot on a college campus. Students like to go from point A to point B, and they don't care where that sidewalk is. <laughs> they want to get to that class from the car to wherever. Um, and so they're constantly making paths, and as they do that, they're destroying structure. Okay, so nothing grows there, that's fine. Maybe we should have put a sidewalk there in the first place. And, you know, so human behavior sometimes can do that. But you know, running equipment over wet soils destroys structure. And when you destroy the structure, you reduce the pores, that permeability, the ability of you know, water to percolate through. You've cut down on the air exchange, you've decreased the infiltration, you've increased <coughs> erosion, reduced percolation, gotten rid of the oxygen. All these bad things happen when you compact the soil. And just kind of, again, showing you a more natural situation versus compacted. And soil particles aren't going to change. They are what they are for the most part. But what's changing is the pore size going to have more water holding capacity, less air, and again, probably not happy roots and probably not happy microbes. Okay, let's talk a little bit about chemistry. And when we talk about chemistry, we're getting into fertility, okay, and things of more of a chemical nature. There is a relationship to the physical and the chemical, but this is almost like a different realm altogether. So we've got nutrients, NPK, maybe you've heard of some of those, the pH, acid, alkaline, and then different types of fertilizer products. So if the soil is fertile, it's considered to be able to have the plant nutrients that plants require to grow. And there are now considered at least to be 17 essential elements, it's depending on the plant, there can be 18 up to 20, I've heard, in some cases. But universally across all plants, in order to become essential, it means if you take one of these away, something's not going to work right with the plant growth and development. And it can be just a tiny little element that's not used very much by the plant, but it can have an impact on that. So it can be a teeny amount or it can be a large amount, but it can either stop a function, stop growth, stop photosynthesis, stop cell division, something is going to go wrong if we do not have the correct um, mix of elements that it needs to grow, these nutrients. So they're essential. If they're not there, the only way to correct it is to add that nutrient back in. Now, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are three of those 17. These are usually naturally occurring in the soil and organic matter, um, and those are going to be important as well. So they come from the atmosphere, from water, from organic matter. So we kind of take those for granted. It's the other 14 that we also further subdivide as being either a macronutrient or a micronutrient. And a macronutrient just means it's used in a large amount. Micronutrients or trace elements are used in a small <coughs> amount. So the primary ones, the big three, are N, P, and K, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Also extremely important, used in fairly large quantities, are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. Now, when we think of the NPK, that's usually what may be deficient in a soil and may be what's in a bag of fertilizer sometimes with some calcium, magnesium, and sulfur mixed in, depending on you know, read your labels and you can find out. The trace elements um, are used in extremely small amounts. A lot of times we don't need to worry about these, but if we are seeing symptoms of deficiency, we do want to pay attention to them. If our pH is way out of whack, sometimes the micronutrients can also become either 
toxic, too much of it, or not enough of it, they can become deficient. So these are your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight micronutrients. Six of them above are macros. And then the carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, also macronutrients, but again, they're the, the ones we sort of take for granted and don't usually need to worry about. Now, again, in some plants, sodium, silicon, and cobalt are also considered essential or beneficial, but they haven't really risen up to essential yet. Okay, so water actually makes up 90% of the plant. Water is extremely important for plant growth and development. It keeps the plants cool, transports the nutrients and the minerals through that, and it continually is evapotranspiring from plants. So it comes in through the roots, usually leaves through the leaf surface of the plant, condenses up in the atmosphere, gives us rain, etc., and falls back to the ground, hopefully, and then we've got this sort of water cycle going on. Um, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, again, are the three that we need for photosynthesis to occur. They're extremely essential. We get them typically from water or from the atmosphere. Nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, calcium, and sulfur, and again, the micronutrients and then these last three that are important but not essential for all plants. But it's these ones up here that you kind of want to pay attention to as being a possibility of why something might not be working with your plant. Question? Yes? Um, I thought that chlorine was a little bit toxic for the microbes. It what, can be. So what, what part of the plant uh, chemical process requires chlorine? You know, I think we're going to get to that. Um, but there are some plants that are very sensitive to chlorine, too. And so there's certain house plants and other things that don't like a lot of it. There's some that are very sensitive to excess amounts of iron, but others that just have to have a high amount of iron. So every plant's individual, but there is, I think I have it in here, and I just can't remember off the top of my head. It's not a major um, thing, but apparently it's, again, probably some hormone function or something of enzyme or something like that. Okay, so one of the other things to know about these nutrients is the plants use them in their ionic forms. They're either positive or negatively charged. When they get broken down in organic matter, you open up a bag of fertilizer and water it in, whatever. It's these ionic forms of cations which are positively charged anions which are negatively charged, that is what is absorbed by the plant root. Again, it can be absorbed by the roots and adsorbed by soil particles, which means they can cling to these soil particles. Guess what? Clay soil, lots of surface area, holds lots of positively charged ions. Okay, so not only does it hold water, it also holds nutrients. Organic matter is the same, holds a high amount of positively charged ions. So organic matter and clay are actually really important in our soil for nutrient holding capacity. And again, uh, we oftentimes look at our soil for helping us store long term. Some of these minerals, they maybe even are from the parent material or they're able to hold on to them in a charged situation. Organic matter is another way we can store nutrients in the soil. And then they can also be held on the soil colloids. So these negative charges in the soil can hold on to positively charged ions. So this is getting into chemistry a little bit. So we have what's called cation exchange capacity. We have minerals that are part of the organic matter in minerals that are found actually on some of these parent materials. They all get dissolved in solution and then they are taken up by the plant roots. And here's a little bit of a blow up of a root hair and it is bringing in calcium which is a positively charged ion. One calcium with a double charge goes in 
hydrogen ion or two goes out, okay? And they can be held on the soil particle and just kind of waiting around until they're needed again. Magnesium, double charge. Again, it's held onto the soil particle. Potassium, there's another calcium, another potassium. So positively charged ions of these nutrients are held on to negative charges on the soil particles. Clay has a lot of negative charges. Organic matter has a lot of negative charges as well. Okay, and then they exchange them. The root hair takes them in, the root hair gives them out. And they can penetrate these cell walls. They're taken in in a soil solution in the water, dissolved in that, so some comes in, some goes out. Guess what? The root doesn't care where it came from. If it came out of a bag of Scott's fertilizer, came out of your fancy chicken manure or cow or wherever, it just wants those nutrients, those ions, go in and go out. So don't spend a lot of time in those sorts of things worrying about all your sources. But okay, got one minute here to kind of wrap up this a little bit. But the soil collides here, again, are these tiny clay and humus particles. So if you've got a lot of that humus floating up in there, that's a good thing. They're going to be carrying an electric charge. That's why they float. That's why your clay stays suspended, are these charges on it. And then they actually can hold on to these nutrients. So the more organic matter, the more clay, the more what we call cation exchange capacity of exchanging these cations of various nutrients in the soil. So they're positively charged, they're attracted to negative charges. Now, some nutrients only come in the anion form or the negative form, so they're not always held in this situation. And they're the ones that tend to leach a lot. Um, so different types of clays all have different properties. So whether you're coming from mica, smectite, kaolinite, vermiculite, or oxide clays, you know, these are just all different types of clay minerals or organic matter, depending on that crystalline structure, you can store more or less amounts. So soil is the source of most nutrients except nitrogen. Usually we have to add that or it comes from organic matter or something we add to it. But they can typically store a lot in the soil. And let's see here. So we'll just talk a little bit more about this and we'll get into some pH. Um, this afternoon. So, okay, it's time for lunch.